Hi, welcome to MA342 Topology Lecture 6. And today what I thought I'd do, oh, and I'll just switch people's, and mute everybody. I've muted everybody. Um, what I'll do today is, uh, I, well, what did I, I've done so far, I've kind of given an informal introduction to topology. And then the last lecture or two, I've given some very precise formal definitions. What is a... A topological space, what is a, a connected component, uh, what's a continuous function. And there's a lot more to say about all of those uh, definitions and concepts. But what I thought I'd do today is um, try to keep people on board by giving a lecture, kind of justifying why we teach topology. So, I mean, the real reason why you teach, why, why I study maths is because it's interesting, it's beautiful, it's kind of, it's a world on its own. But Maths also has applications, and although they're not necessarily what drive me to study maths, it is a, a driving force for many people. So what I thought I'd do today is I'd try to explain why topology... For example, why is topology in the financial maths course? If people have come to go with to study financial maths, why on earth are they studying topology? Well, eventually we'll see, I'm at the end of the course, we'll talk about Nash equilibria game theory and use topology to prove the existence of Nash equilibria. So in economics and financial maths, there are reasons for having uh, topological results, developing topological results. But more immediately, what I thought I'd do today is um, I would... I was going to talk about one fairly recent, you know, the last decade or two, two decades uh, or so of applied topology. And what I was going to do to, to begin with is I was going to go to the web page uh, and click on the company IASTI. So I hope this works now. IASTI. And talk a little bit around IASTI. So let me just do this. Um, if I move my picture out of the way, it might help. You see the picture. Um, IASTI is a company that was set up, I don't know, 15 years ago by Gunnar Carlsen in Stanford, who uh, is a topologist. So he was just a professor. I think he's retired now. He's a professor of topology. He and then two graduate students, one of whom did a PhD with him in topology, uh, set up this company and it's become very successful. And it's based on topological ideas. Topological ideas applied to the world of finance, data analysis, and so on. So let me just, how do I, if, with my pen, can I scroll down? I can. Um, what does IASTI do? It exposes financial crime. Finance. So if you're interested in finance and exposing financial crime, maybe topology, you, you know, if you go to IASTI to help, they'll use topological ideas. Um, Real results from my hour, you can go down and down and down. Risk, liquidity, profitability, all based on topology. This whole company, um, the it's it's founded on topological notions. Actually, something called topological data analysis. So they an analyze data using topology. And so on. You get an idea. Oh, I don't know what these things mean. Real KYX. I don't know what real KYX intelligence is. Uh, real results from Ch Chasty Churn. Um, and so on. It 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 goes on. It it's a it's a it's a company that that solves problems for businesses, and it uses topology. Now, what I was going to do is uh, I was going to go to I, I bookmarked this. There's a four minute explanation of topology and how it can be used in data analysis by the f founder of this company, Gunnar Carlson. So just for f I think it's four or five minutes. I hope it's here. It is. I'm going to play a YouTube video of by Gunnar Carlson explaining topology. So maybe if I just do this and start it, four minutes, four minutes, 20 seconds. What do we think of when we hear the word data? We might think of spreadsheets. We might think of cell phone GPS records. We might think of internet traffic, or we might even think of DNA sequences. All these sources provide very large and complicated data sets to analyze. How do we make sense of large arrays of numbers in columns and rows? Existing methods for studying data sets typically proceed by asking very specific questions of your data. But let's think about the whole problem a little bit differently. Suppose that our data is divided into groups. Let's represent each group by a node. And let's also represent the relationships between the groups by connections between the nodes. Now what we see emerging here, instead of an unstructured mass of numbers, 
we instead have a kind of shape or network which is really representing the shape of our data we can now use our visual system to look at the data and identify features in the network which correspond to patterns in the data these patterns are what we mean when we say extracting knowledge from data the methodology I've been describing for you is called topology topology is the subfield of mathematics that concerns itself with the study of shape and it has its origins in the 18th century with the Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler Euler became aware of a challenge problem concerning the seven bridges crossing the river Pregel in Königsberg in Old Prussia. The question was, can you stand at the end of one of the bridges, walk across each of the bridges in succession, and return to where you started and cross each bridge exactly once? Now what Euler did was really extraordinary. He took all the information about the bridges and the river and the islands and land masses and converted it all into a simple network. And in doing so, he found that in fact it's not possible to walk across all the bridges exactly once. Topology has been studied as part of math for its own sake for the last 250 years. But what's very exciting is that in the last 15 years, we have found that it has applications to many different real world problems. One of those is the analysis and understanding of high dimensional and complex data sets. This new area of study is called topological data analysis and it's changing the way that people are able to understand and analyze their data. There are three big concepts about topology that give it its power for analyzing and understanding shape. The first one of these properties is called coordinate invariance, and it refers to the fact that topology measures properties of shapes that don't change even as you rotate the shape or maybe change the coordinate system in which you're viewing the shape. The second big property is called deformation invariance. So a property of shapes is said to be deformation invariant if that property doesn't change, even though I might stretch or squash the shape without tearing it. Humans are really good at recognizing deformation invariant properties. That ability is what allows us to recognize that a letter A is a letter A, no matter what font that letter is written in. Thinking this way can also lead you to some surprising conclusions. For example, that a donut is very much like a coffee cup. The final property is that of compressed representations. Suppose we have in front of us a sphere. That's infinite amounts of information, which is very hard for us to process and understand. On the other hand, suppose I approximate the shape by an icosahedron, still very much like a sphere, but now it's represented by a list, a simple list consisting of 12 nodes, 30 edges, and 20 faces. The focus on connectivity and continuity information allows topology to recognize patterns in data which make that data relevant. The three fundamental properties combine in very striking ways to allow one to analyze and understand very large and complicated data sets. But this is only the beginning. Topological data analysis represents a fundamental advance in machine learning. In the near future, machines will help humans organize, simplify, and understand their very large and complicated data sets this partnership between man and machine will have impact for all areas of human endeavor. Okay, so I'll close the, the web. Um, right, so that, that's, that's, that's a, a, a hand-wavy introduction to topological data analysis. Let me continue in that fashion by waving hands um, and I'm going to say a little bit more about this topological data analysis so hopefully now I can uh, put something in front of you. Does anybody know, you can speak or put it in the chat, what that is that I'm showing you? Anybody recognize that? That kind of tree, that whatever you, you call it. Anybody? Network, it's a network, but anybody, it's kind of a famous one. It was actually <clears throat> written by a guy who, I, I'm originally from Wales, North Wales, and uh, I, my, where I was born and grew up, Chirk is about um, uh, 18 miles from a place called Shrewsbury. And so the guy that wrote this uh, uh, was from Shrewsbury. Anybody, anybody, anybody be a bit more precise than saying network? It's actually a tree. Darwin, yeah, yeah, Darwin. It's Darwin's tree of life. So what I have done, I hope I can 
I scribbled out. I, I don't understand all of this text in black, but I, I, I found it on the Wikipedia and I've... Um, there. This is what Darwin writes. So he, he scribbles this tree. And the idea then is that um, Darwin went around collecting species. And I suppose the species that he, he collected, the live animals, if you like, he thought of them as being, you know, the, the different types of animals and, and, and species uh, are the no are, are the are the uh, leaves of the tree, the tips of the tree, yeah. So B and A and and whatever D, they're all kind of D might be a cow and B might be a mouse and A might be a tadpole. I, I don't know. Um, and so he thought of them as being somehow related, Darwin, with his, his and his, and that somehow they all would kind of have evolved from ancestors. So the nodes internal to the tree. Uh, maybe they correspond to species that no longer exist and then they evolved into existing species. So what did get Darwin right? Darwin wrote that I think case must be that one, it's his notebook so it's not great, that, that one generation should have as many living as now. So each, whatever that means, to do this and to have as many species in the same genus requires extinction. So, you know, species become extinct and so on. Thus, between A and B, where's A and B? Here's A, and there's B. Uh, the immense gap of relations, so A and B, whatever they are, they're very far apart. I, I don't know, maybe A is a daffodil and B is a human or something, they're very far apart. Um, uh, C and B, the finest gradation. So C and B, they're distinct species, but they're somehow closer. They're somehow nearer. They're not quite as far apart. Uh, and so on. Thus, general would be formed bearing a relation to ancient types with several extinct forms. And that's Charles Darwin from uh, 1837. Okay, so the notion of representing species or any kind of data via a tree is now very common in biology. Biologists use these things, they're called dendrograms or phylogenetic trees, and it's very related to what Gunnar Carlson was talking about, uh, you know, when he, he explained the basis for the IASTI company. They, they're using the idea of, top I mean, there is topology here. There's a notion of nearness and far away, but not like geometry. I mean, the tree is a tree no matter how you kind of deform it. Um, a is a leaf no matter how you deform it continuously. Uh, so it's topological properties of such things this is kind of Carlson's idea and I'm, I'm going to explain it by means of a, an example. So uh, new page um, I'm, and this relates to one or two problems on the homework sheet so it's, it's very kind of hands-on. Um, introduction to topological data analysis as a heading And the thing about data, whether it be financial data, biological data, you name it, data, uh, often scientists or economists, whatever, have a notion of how similar two bits of data are. A mouse is kind of similar to a rat, I, I don't know, but it's quite different to a whale or a human, you know, so, so there's a notion or um, this company's stocks are somewhat similar to that company's, but they're quite different. So there's nothing... So, so let me start off with a, with a toy example, um, and I'll work hard at this toy example, and I've got four bits of data, which I'm going to call um, H, uh, M, I'm going to copy my notes so I get it right, R, C, and W, and I'm going to write a table down of distances between these bits of data. Now, if you want to um, make things concrete, you can think of H as standing for human. I'm going to make the numbers up. The numbers don't bear any relation to real science. I just make the numbers up to illustrate how it is. M could stand for mouse. Uh, R could stand for rat. Uh, C could stand for cat and W could stand for whale. 
But there are financial mathematicians, there's, I don't know, a lot of you, 60 or something, or 50 financial mathematicians in the class who mightn't be interested in uh, animals. So let's just be silly for a moment. Give me some names of um, companies. What, give me a company starting with H, you know, whose shares I might be interested in. Have a bit of Honda. Okay, Honda is a company. And I'm last year, give me a company starting with M. Microsoft, oh, axis of evil, Microsoft, Microsoft. Give me a company starting with R. Everybody's stuck. Ripple, is Ripple a company? What's Ripple? What does Ripple do? Is it a company? What does Ripple do? I don't know. It's a company, is it? Cryptocurrency, okay, fair enough. Ripple, ripple, ripple. C. Give me a company starting with C, I don't know. Your financial, there's a lot of financial mathematicians. You should know the names of all the companies in the world. Give me a company beginning with C. Coalsoft, okay, sounds good. <laughs> don't know quite. Uh, and a company beginning with W. Uh, I'm at a loss now, so can anybody give me a company beginning with W? It's one way of getting people to type things in the chat anyway. Walmart, okay, Walmart, Walmart, that's grand. Walmart. So uh, the distance between, so, so somehow you're measuring the profiles of these companies and some financial expert has said, you know, there's a way to see how similar companies are or how different. I'm going to talk about different distance because I, you know, I think of distances as metrics. And so Honda is a distance zero from Honda. That has to be the case. I mean, the distance from Graham to Graham is zero. Or Honda to Honda has to be zero. And I guess the same. Microsoft is a distance zero from Microsoft. And Ripple is a distance zero from Ripple. And Coalsoft is a different distance zero from Coalsoft. And Walmart is a distance zero from Walmart. Now, how similar, how different are Halfords to Walmart? Well, the, these financial experts have told us that there's a distance of 11. The distance between uh, Honda and Microsoft, I don't know, on the, and whatever units they're using is 11. And the distance to Ripple from Honda is 10. And the distance from Honda to Coalsoft is 14. And the distance from uh, Honda to Walmart is 22. I don't know. And these are distances. So the distance from X to Y should be the same as the distance from Y to X. So I'm going to copy these numbers, same numbers down. The distance from um, Microsoft to Honda is the same as the distance from Honda to Microsoft. So it's 11 and so on. 10 comes down here. 14 goes there. 22 goes there, and then I fill in the rest of the, 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 you know, the entries symmetrically. So let's stick for fun a 3, a 13, and a 21, and the symmetric, so a 3, a 13, and a 21. <clears throat> and then let's stick in a 12 and a 20, and we'll do it symmetrically, a 12 and a 20, and then let's stick in a 16 and a 16. So that's the kind of information that a mathematician statistician or whatever or a, or a data analyst might be given by a, a, a company you've got we've got all of you know, we've got these spreadsheets of you know those are the distances um so let's just uh record what i'm saying here that the distance between a company and itself is zero and the distance between a company and some other company, H and M, has to be equal to the distance between M and H. Distance should be symmetric like that. Okay, so um, what's the idea? The, the financial company that has all of this information says, I want to use that information somehow. I want to see it. And it's not very, it's not very enlightening the way you can look at a table of figures, but what does a table of figures, and I've just chosen uh, five companies, you might have 5,000, you know, so you could imagine a table, 5,000 rows and 5,000 columns, just looking at a table of numbers doesn't tell you much, so can we somehow visualize it? And that's just the kind of thing that topologists love doing, they, they tend to visualize in high dimensions, 
Okay, so the topology, one way of thinking of topology, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's more than a bag of tricks, but it's a collection of tools that do, does enable mathematicians to think about how to see in some way high dimensional data, not see in a, in a crude way like plot it on a on a computer screen, but but you know mathematically see it. So let's try to see this data uh, in the way that Gunnar Carlson's company would do it. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to choose um, some number epsilon greater than zero. I'll take some values in a moment. Called a threshold. Yep. Uh, and I'm going to consider the graph. which I'm going to write down as G for graph, subscript epsilon, because it's going to depend on my threshold. Okay, It's going to depend on my threshold. Call it G epsilon. So it's a graph. So I want to tell you what the vertices and edges are of the graph. Um, let me come back to black. Uh, with vertices, um, it's just going to be five of them. H, M, whatever these letters stand for, R, C, W. At this stage, I don't care what the letters stand for. I'm doing mathematics. And with an edge, um, from X to Y, where X and Y are two of these letters, I'm going to have an edge from X to Y. Whenever the distance between x and y is less than or equal to epsilon. Yeah. So let me illustrate it. Can I do it? Um, where can I illustrate? Maybe I can illustrate it over here. Uh, do I have enough? No, I'll illustrate it down here. Okay, so I'm going to put five. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take the. I'm going to consider the example um, of epsilon equal to eleven. I'm going to take epsilon to equal to eleven. I'm going to draw this graph for you. Um, so let me write down g eleven. Epsilon is equal to eleven. What does it look like? It's got five vertices. I'll do the vertices in red. Um, so it's five vertices, and I know, I mean, I, it's just a graph. I can plonk my vertices anyway. It doesn't really matter, but just that I know I, know I, I want this to, to look nice, so I'm going to decide to plonk them like this. Five vertices. The vertices correspond to the, to the letters. Um, but it's a graph. I can, I, the, the vertices just exist in the ether. It's just that I have to, when I'm drawing it, I have to plonk them on a piece of paper somehow to make it look nice for you. But they just exist in the ether. And then there's an edge uh, whenever the distance between two letters is less than or equal to epsilon, which is 11. So let's go back to the table. Let's look at all these entries which are less than or equal to 11. H and M is less than or equal to 11. The distance between H and M is 11. That's less than or equal to 11. So there's an edge between H and M. So let me put the edge in. I'll use a different color for the edge. Um, let me use a different color. There's an edge between H and M. And let's go back. Uh, what else, where else do we have an 11? Uh, or something less than 10. So H and R are within a distance 10. So there's an edge between H and R. H and R, there's an edge. And let's go back to the um, <clears throat> the graph. Where else do we have something? Three. There's a three. M and R is a three. So, so that's there's an edge between M and R. And I think that's it, isn't it? It's those are the only points within a distance eleven of each other. The other numbers are all bigger. Yep. So for epsilon equal to 11, we get a graph. Now, um, <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to think of this graph as a topological space. And there are various ways to do it, but I'm going to give, give a, a simple. So I've got this graph 
and I'm going to think of it as a topological space as follows. I don't know that this is the... Well, it's one way to think of it as a topological space. So let me explain. We regard this graph uh, as a subspace. Oh, there's a topological word I can use. So it says, I'm going to regard it as a subset. Any subset of a topological space is a subspace with a subspace topology as a subspace of five-dimensional space with the standard topology, so I call it E5. How do I do that? By identifying... So I'm going to think of it as, so the vertices had better lie in, um, in five-dimensional space. Let me take H, Honda. Instead of Honda now, it, for me, it's just going to be a point in five dimensions. What is a point in five dimensions? Well, it's just a, a sequence of five numbers. Uh, and the sequence of five numbers I'm going to think of as Honda is just going to be one, zero, 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 zero. Or put another way, the standard basis vector for the, the, the space R5. And then the next number M, I'm going to think of as being the point zero, 01, zero, zero, 0000. If you like, I can call it E2. Um, uh, R, I'll think of as the point zero, zero, 001, zero, 00. Or if you like, you could call it E3, the standard basis vector E3 for the vector space R5. Uh, C, will be the point zero, 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 will correspond to the point. So instead of call soft, we're just thinking of a point in five dimensional space, which <clears throat> is the, the fourth standard basis vector. And W, Walmart, <clears throat> is the point zero, 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 one. OK, there's a little bit of mathematics. Walmart is now just a point in five dimensional space. Um, what about the edges? Well, the graph G11. Let's just go back. We've drawn G11 here. Uh, where is it? This is my graph. I'm now thinking of all these points, R, H, W, M, Y, as living in five-dimensional space in, in, the, in the way that I explained there. Um, and now in five-dimensional space, I can draw the line from R to H. R and H are just two points. And I can draw the straight line segment from R to H, and I can think of it as an edge. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to think of it as an edge, as a, as, as a, yeah. So think the graph G11 can be thought of as a subspace, yeah, a subset with the subspace topology of E5 with points or vertices um, the standard basis vectors and the line segments. So think of the set consisting of these five points together with the line segments um, from E1 to E2. Uh, let me just get this right. So which line segments? R to H is um, E1 to E3, um, and what have I got? R to H, H to M is H to M is E1 to E2. I've got that, and the other one is R to M, isn't it? R to M, which is um, E2 to E3. Yeah. So now we have a topological space. What on earth is the point of doing this? Well, topology is a whole world of mathematics that has its concepts, its definitions, its jargon, which we can now apply to this data set. Yep. So the graph has, well, we don't, unfortunately, I haven't done too much topology with it yet, yet, but one thing I've talked about is connected components of topological spaces. So let's just use that language uh, in this setup. The graph... G11 has 
so many connected components. Makes sense to talk like that because G11 now is just a is a subspace of R5 E5, so it's a topological space. Can anybody tell me how many connected components are there in G11? There's a picture of G11. How many connected components? Three. Yep, it's three, isn't it? There's there are three parts to this graph. There's the all of this. Sorry, there's a, to this topological space. There are all of these points forming the the kind of the the, the triangle together with this isolated point W and this isolated point C. So there are three connected components. So we can use the language of topology in a very basic way, but, but, but that's only because we... Um, so let me say three. Um, uh, the connected components are... Let me, let me say what the components are. I pressed the wrong... What are the components? Now, what, what have I done now? Uh, black components uh, what are they I'll call them it was X, it was W so let me call it W uh, C was on its own and there was the the component RHM I'll, I'll put an X like that okay so WC and RHM are the, the three bits I mean I have to label them I've got three bits to my topological space RHM W and C I mean I mean the this this the space consisting of all the points from R to H, H to M, M to R, all on, on those three line segments. Yep. So I've got three connected components. Now, just for the, the uh, I'm going to speed things up, but now let's look at um, another one, G12. Um which I guess I can draw down here. So let me copy G11, first of all, RHWMC, RHWMC, I'll write those down, RHWMC. And I'm now in the process of drawing for you G12. So my threshold is 12. Well, anything which is le less than or equal to a distance 11 apart is certainly less than or equal to a distance 12 apart. But my question is, are there any more edges in my topological space? Are there any more edges? Uh, let me go back. Can anybody tell me if I can go back? Is there any other edge that I should or more that I should add in. Somebody is saying CR. I think CR, yeah, because CR, where is it gone? Where's my table of data? CR is a distance 12, yeah? So RC or CR is another edge. So G12 is a bit bigger than G11. It's got this edge. I'm in five dimensional space, yeah? So, and I'm drawing it for you in a plane, so I have to do strange things. This straight edge, you know, looks like that. I've just drawn a straight edge for you in five-dimensional space. Of course, it doesn't look straight in, in, um, in, on the plane, but, but it, I'm really in five-dimensional space. I've got that edge as well, and that's it. So tell me, how many connected components does G12 have? Uh, so G12 has how many connected components? Two, yep, I agree. Yeah, there's just two. Com so you see where we're getting. Um... Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to express. Uh, why did I take eleven and why did I take twelve? That's terrible. What I'm going to take is I'm going to take all infinite values from zero up to infinity of threshold. I'm going to take all possible values of the threshold and I'm going to express my answer as follows as a dendrogram. Let me go to a new page. A dendrogram, or it's called a phylogenetic tree, it originates from Darwin's sketch. What I'm doing now is really goes back to the guy from Shrewsbury, you know, Darwin. Um, a, a dendrogram, or a phylogenetic tree, is used in the world of finance. Uh, 
as follows. So I'm going to just draw a picture of a dendrogram. Summarizes the inclusions of connected components. Let me just explain that. Uh, summarizes summarizes the inclusions. So subset inclusions inclusions of connected components. What does that mean? Let me just go back. I've got two graphs drawn here. I've got G11 and I've got G12. And you see that G11 is actually a subset of G12. G11 is a subset of G12. So it's actually a subspace of G12. And since it's a subspace, um, I can ask which components of G11, what do the components, so two components of G11 map into this big component of G12. The RHM component of G11 includes into this big component. So does the singleton component C of G11 includes into this big component. And W um, remains on its own. So I've got this notion of inclusion of connected components. Yeah, so we've got functions or inclusions of connected components. So let me just summarize what we've got the table now. Let me write it as G0. Uh, I'm going to want 20 of these. So G2. I hope I can do it like this. Let me G2, G graph G4, epsilon 4, G6, G8, G10, G12, G14. I'm just taking various values 16, 18. 20. I'm actually taking epsilon from ranging from 0 up to infinity, but I'm just going to uh, draw it at a few particular points, 20 of these points. So let me look at the graph G0. Can anybody say in the chat, what can you say about the graph G0? It's a graph consisting of five points and, and how many edges? How many connected components? How many connected components does G0 have? Five. So I'm going to write down five connected components mathematically let me just put let me each connected component I'm going to think of as a dot one connected component two three four five so we can get the chat going in um, g2 how many connected components in g2 in g2 if I take epsilon to be two the threshold to be two how many connected components five again yep so I got five connected components now comes the difficult question. In G4, how many connected components? Because I don't know if you can see my... In G4, how many connected components in G4? Four, okay, you're, you're faster than me. There's four, because there's, there's an extra edge. There's an edge. There's an edge between M and R, so we lose a connected component. But you see how I'm talking of topology in terms of connected components? Uh, in G6, can anybody do it? Uh, uh, well, I'll do it. In G6, there are four connected components. Uh, in G8, I think there are four connected components. And then in G10, when we come to G10, um, if you draw G10, which I haven't actually drawn, but G10 uh, has three edges. It has H to R, H... And R to M, it has H to it has two edges. It has H to M and R to H. It has two edges. It's only got three connected components. So I'm just going to put three down here. Um, and G12, I'm I'm going to speak to just has two connected components. And G14 ha again has two connected components. And G16, I'm afraid everything is connected up. There's only one connected component evermore. You know, so it just goes one. Um, let me use a different colour, uh, just to, to, let's just say some things. G0 has five connected components, and one, each connected component includes into, the, the components include into distinct connected components of G2. G2 has five connected components, but G4 
only has four. And what actually happens is two of the connected components of G2 coalesce. They include into a common connected component of G4. Um, each connected component of G4 includes into a distinct connected component of G6, and each connected component of G6 includes into a distinct connected component of G8. But what actually happens as we go from G8 to G10, the inclusion of sets, the inclusion of topological spaces, uh, what actually happens at the level of connected components, two connected components of G8 get included into a common connected component of G10. So Darwin was really doing topology. He probably didn't realize it, uh, especially because topology wasn't really established in 1837. Uh, two connected components of G10 get included into a common connected component of G12, and so on. And we get this picture, which is the kind of picture that Charles Darwin drew of a tree. And now it's called a phylogenetic tree or a, or a, or a dendrogram or whatever. Um, and <clears throat> so this is a, 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 a dendrogram. And what does it really tell us? Well, these non-horizontal lines uh, in data analysis are not particularly, see the diagonal is, they're not particularly interesting. They tell us something about how the connected components coalesce. That's not particularly interesting. When a, when a statistician looks at a set of data, they don't say how do things coalesce, they say how many clusters are there? Okay, statisticians don't use connected components, they use cluster. How many clusters are there in my data set? So uh, rather than a dendrogram, we can uh, represent this as a, as a barcode. barcode. What on earth does that mean? Well, I'm just going to explain it by means of drawing the dots. I'm going to draw for you a barcode. Two, three, four, five. One, two. I'm going to have the same dots and I'm going to have the same horizontal edges as well. So I'm just repeating what I have above. I suppose if I'd written this out beforehand it would be helpful, but uh, I haven't, so tough. Um, I'm trying to copy the thing that I've got above. And then all of the horizontal edges I'll include, but none of the, you know, the diagonal edges. And this is a barcode. So I've got a barcode consisting of lines of different length. And when you're trying to cluster things, long lines mean this cluster lasts for a long time. It really does seem to be there. This cluster just lasts for a short time, the one at the bottom. It's probably just a bit of noise, you know, a little bit of noise and it soon co coalesces. But this one here lasts for a long time. This one also lasts for a long time. So then you can look at a barcode and say, how many long lines are there? Of course, what do we mean by long? Well, you have to ask a statistician or somebody, the scientist, what does long mean? But at least we've reduced it to how many clusters are there is reduced to how many connected components in a topological space are there, which is reduced to, by looking at inclusions, how many long lines are there in a, in a barcode? Now, I've got <clears throat> five minutes because what I've said there is nothing particularly exciting. This is really just using, this is just standard cluster analysis using the language of topology. If you do a course in machine learning or statistics, they teach you about cluster analysis. Um, the only thing is they don't use the language of topology. Well, why? What's the point of using a different language? Why use topology? Why don't I just use standard statistical language? What is the point of using topology? 
The point is that topology is a vast area of pure mathematics that's been developed for a well over a hundred years. Uh, a fantastically deep, uh, exciting concepts that up until very recently have only ever been used in the esoteric world of advanced theoretical pure mathematics. But usually clever ideas can also be applied to the dirty real world. It's not the thing that really excites me, but, but let's see. So if we're using the language of, plus, uh, of topology, I can say, well, look, path compo connected components are the simplest thing. It's the first thing that you teach a class. What about other things in topology? Could you use those? Well, we haven't done many other things, but we did use the Euler characteristic. So let me just talk a little bit about the Euler characteristic. Um, I'm going to go five minutes over, but I will, I will definitely not go more than five minutes over. <clears throat> uh, I'm just going to say something, because um, I want to talk about a, a recent research article um, in biology. So let me first of all say phylogenetic trees, or dendrograms, or whatever they're called, are used throughout bioinformatics or biology or whatever you want to call it. Yep, based on Darwin's idea. However, Darwin had the idea that a human doesn't mate with a donkey. <laughs> it's reasonable enough. You don't ever get an offspring of a human and a donkey. You don't get an offspring of a cow and a sheep. Cows don't mate with sheep. Well, at least they don't breed. Um, so, so Darwin had this idea that you get a tree, that two distinct species never come together and produce a common offspring, a sheep and a mouse. There's no kind of, you know, common offspring. But Darwin is fine until you get to the world of, oh, these days everybody, for some reason, I don't know why, is talking about viruses, viruses, viruses. So let me talk about viruses. Reassortment. You see, Darwin's theory is fine as far as it goes, but if you want to talk about viruses, maybe it's not so spot on. Maybe you want to adapt it. Reassortment. If a single host, let's say a human, I'm going to read it, is infected by two different strains of an influenza virus, then it's possible, and it happens frequently, that the new assembled viral particles will be created from segments of the two strains. Yeah? You get the Brazilian variant, the South African variant, the British variant, of whatever, yeah? You get reassortment. Um, so let me write it down in words. If a single host, e.g. human, uh, is infected <clears throat> by two different Uh, strains of an influenza virus um, it is possible and and happens often it is possible uh, that new assembled viral particles that that new assembled um, viral particles will be created um, from segments uh, some, some of the segments coming from one strain and some of the segments coming from another So this is well documented, uh, I won't write it down, but you know, the 2009 swine flu, the H1N1 virus, <clears throat> actually has a mix of swine, avian and human influenza particles. So, so this, and this isn't kind of captured by Darwin's trees, because the trees assume that dogs don't breed with cats, and that, that <clears throat> trees would assume that 
um, <clears throat> avian uh, uh, influenza doesn't mix with, breed with uh, human influenza, but in fact it does. So we can't use trees anymore. You have to use phylogenetic networks. A phylogenetic genetic network needs to be used when studying the evolution of uh, viruses. And I guess this is so topical that I just couldn't resist throwing it in because we've got all of these because isn't that what everybody's interested in now? What's going to happen when the Brazilian virus infects somebody in Donegal and the British virus? God, you're going to have a Donegal virus, you know, which is the <clears throat> mix of the Brazilian and the... So, and how do you then model and represent uh, all of this evolution? Well, you need a, a I suppose, a... a, a, a uh, so what, what could a network look like? Uh, a network could look like, um, let me just draw one, it doesn't really matter. Um, let, let, me, let me draw it with edges. Uh, one, two, three, four, I, I'm getting a bit confused. I'm just going to try and draw a network. I should be using a single colour really. One down here. One there. So far, I've just drawn a tree, but let me try to make it look like a network. I might have a, a node here, a node there, and edges coming down like this, and then there, and then wow, that's not a tree because I've got a loop in it. Yeah, so uh, you can have things like this. Um, I'm just trying to draw what one. Uh, Example of a network. Where am I going? Uh, let me stick in some more dots here. Um, let me do it like this. So, so now I certainly don't have a tree. I have a network because there are loops in it. Yeah. Um, So now, in terms of, if I go back to phylogenetic trees, what was the important thing? The important thing about phylogenetic trees was really the length, wasn't so much the phylogenetic tree, but it was the barcode. How many long sequences of clusters are there? The, 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 how long does a cluster last? That's the important thing. How long does it last? If it lasts, it's persistent, it's really there. Yep. So um, now, there are holes in this type of evolution setup. It's called, the, there's vertical evolution, but there's also now what's called horizontal evolution. And you get holes in your, in your you get loops. Um, well, what we'd like to do is, firstly, how do you count loops? How do you count loops? I can't resist writing this down. Um, um, so here's a here's a here's a, a a network, and this could be, you know, A and B and so on. Um, um, let me just do an exercise. Let me write down an exercise. I'm not I'm not going to prove it. Exercise. Oh, actually, how many holes are there? Can anybody tell me how many holes are there? How many fields are there in this? tree how many fields how many holes can anybody put it in the chat how many holes are there in the tree three okay there's three holes but i mean typically you'll have thousands of bits of data and you won't be writing it nicely like on a, on a sheet of paper so you, you have to think of mathematical ways of counting the holes um so here's an exercise for any connected graph I can use the word connected because any graph I think of as a topological space. Yep. Uh, we have the Euler characteristic of the graph considered as a topological space is 1 minus the number of holes. 
So if you want the number of holes, just work at the Euler characteristic, uh, you know, and, you, and you, that, that formula will, get, will give it. Um, so let's just do the example uh, with the above example. The above example, the Euler characteristic of G should be 1 minus, people are saying in the chat there are three holes, it should be 1 minus 3, should be minus 2. Let's just double check that I've written my fact down correctly. Let me check it in a horrible colour. Check. In the above example, the number of vertices, if I've written it right, uh, let me just calculate the number of vertices. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. There are 15 vertices. And let me count the number of edges in the above graph. The above graph, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 edges. And so we're done. Um, v minus E, there are no, and, and the Euler characters of a graph, a graph has no fields, it's one dimensional, is equal to minus 2. Now, um, I'm just going to, what I'll do is I'm going to stop here, but I'm going to say, and then I'll put a link to it for those who are interested. Gunnar Carlson um, and two others, jo Joseph Chan and uh, Raoul Rabadou. Um, use a version of the Euler characteristic known as persistent homology Um, to study horizontal evolution of certain influenza pandemics. What I'll do is I'll put a link to that page um, to, to, the, to this research article but the interesting thing is what you have to do is uh, you have to say which are the most persistent holes what's the size of these holes which is the biggest hole to write down the biggest hole you somehow have to write down something like a barcode for Euler characteristics and that's what they do in their paper okay so the point of this talk is not so much that I think you should be studying uh, phylogenetic trees and viral evolution but the point is that by using the language of topology to study data, whether it be financial or biology, biological or whatever, it leads on to naturally to using other topological concepts like Euler characteristic and so on, and even more advanced ones when studying data. Okay, so I'll stop there. I really apologize. I went 10 minutes over, or nine minutes over today. Uh, I won't do that again, but I, I'll stop recording now. And if there are any questions, uh, fire away.